coming of age. Uh, that's who we are. We are part of the, under the umbrella of PSS, formerly known as Presbyterian Senior Services. We are all about positive aging. This program started at Temple University about 18 years ago when we recognized that there was a great uh, longevity bonus that most of us were living into and that there were ways that we could continue to offer uh, the gifts and the talents and the energy and the passion that we had. And so this program came out of that uh, and was designed for people 50 and over. We were looking at people who were approaching retirement and those who were just retired and those who had been retired for a while. So we wanna build up these communities of people to explore how we can live more fully with purpose and meaning in our life. Uh, we have uh, affiliates across the United States and our headquarters is in New York City. Next slide. Uh, our signature program is the Explore Your Future workshop, a four series workshop to really decide where do you go next? Um, how do you identify what your, what your strengths are and how you can put them to best use? We have training for nonprofit agencies uh, on the best utilization of volunteers. We have had live events, networking socials and special presentations and small groups and large groups. And we have two websites, comingofage.org and comingofagenyc.org. We're also on social media. And we would love to have you sign up for our newsletters if you are not already signed up. We send out a New York City newsletter on the first of the month, and we send out a national newsletter uh, on the 15th of each month. So what are the benefits? Well, the program is a proven program and very powerful in conveying this positive aging mentality that we're trying to capture. We do education, we inspire, we challenge you, we empower you. And it doesn't matter where you are on the age range from 50 all the way up to 150. We'd love to have you be a part of our organization and our uh, offerings. So we want you to become a part of a broader network. And there are a lot of things going on across the world in terms of utilizing the talents of the older adults. If you want to sign up for the newsletters, you can go to either one of our um, websites, comingofagenyc or comingofage.org. Also, if you want to find more webinars of interest like this, we encourage you to get involved in our PSS Life University opportunities at pssusa.org slash events. I am so pleased to present today this rich and interactive program in light of all the changes that are affecting us day to day and especially our future. This afternoon, you'll be hearing from two professionals who are seeking to make sense of the emotional overload we've been feeling, the economic changes we're going through, the call out for social justice in our society, and maybe we're feeling a little bit guilty that we're just not able to do something to make a real difference in the face of all we've been through since the beginning of this year. But there is hope. And if anyone can give that to you, it's our presenters today, Judith Koenig and Jerry Sedler. They're here to help you reflect on your life and help get more clarity, how to look ahead and perhaps redefine your purpose and help you rethink your goals for the next chapter in your wise and wonderful life. Judith has rewired herself from classical musician to journalist to senior communications professional and now as a work-life strategy coach certified by the International Coaching Federation. She's also a member of the professional women's organization, the Transition Network in Philadelphia. Jerry is co-author with her husband of the internationally renowned book, Don't Retire, Rewire, now in its third edition. Jerry's been doing research on personal growth and transition for over 15 years. She's been senior advisor to the conference board on the mature workforce and former editor at large of Working Woman. 
Both women are professional colleagues and friends, and they share a commitment to helping you claim your dreams, and they both share a love of opera. And now I turn it over to Judith. The, actually, Pam, you're going to turn it over to me. I am, then you can have it, Jerry. Take well, it away. Oh, let's see, maybe we can put up the first slide, Judith. Yes, I need Shaina to stop sharing her screen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think as we're going to go through this, I'm going to say something, and that is all of a sudden you realize, oh my gosh, my hair is longer, it's also blonder, and I'm wearing glasses. So I thought, well, I better get a new, uh, you know, uh, picture there. But, oh, it's, it's terrific to have all of you here today. That's what really makes this so special. So thank you and, and welcome. Um, when Judith and I were talking about doing this program and when Pam and the team said, let's do it, we thought this really was the perfect time because really as of today, being here in New York City, this is almost the third month of isolation. And so we thought this would be the time that people need to be looking ahead. And I hope many of you, as you're sitting there thinking, yes, that's why we came on here. And all of a sudden, I have to say, too, that I bet over these three months, we've learned a lot about ourselves. We probably learned a lot about other people, too. As somebody said to me, we've learned about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so I hope that's brought up a little bit of laughter from your end. But the truth is, I think that many people discovered things during this time period, or they hope, I hope that you did, that will make you say, maybe I want to do a few things different as I go forward. When Judith and I came up with the second part of the title, Rewiring in the New Era, rewiring some of you are probably pretty familiar with the concept. For those of you who aren't though, rewiring is really about taking the energy that you normally gave to work or play or the opera or whatever and putting it into new areas. And I think the surprising thing is we realize that many of the places where we gave our energy, you can't go there anymore. So that's the first part in the rewiring. The second part is when we talk about in the new era, we didn't want to get into the words, what's the new normal? Folks, I guess the best takeaway is we're creating what it's going to look like for each and every one of us. It isn't going to happen overnight. There isn't going to be one collective new aha moment. It's each of us individually. But the reality is, I think we know now, it is going to begin with us. And it's going to begin with our attitude of wanting to change and being open to change and being desirous of it. And some of the work that I have done over the past, um, gosh, since 2002, when, when the book had first come out, um, I got some calls in the past few months now from people as far away as Dubai, where I did work, to Des Moines. And I think it really summed it up when somebody called and he said, I need help. I think I'm flunking isolation. And that really started me thinking because our world has changed, our larger as well as our intimate world. And all of a sudden you realize that as much as many of us could have been control freaks, we can't control much. We never really could. So I wanna say the first thing is we can control our attitude. And I'd like to think, and I see the 120 participants on today, your attitude is saying, I am looking ahead. This is a good positive mental attitude. And the other thing we can control is our effort. So that's why in developing this program today, Judith and I wanted to be honest. We wanted to be cognizant of what we could deliver in this time period, but we want to touch both sides. We want to get you thinking from the attitudinal and also from the action. And I myself just had the chance to sit on a very interesting webinar. And the leader on that program was talking about two different ways to think about the future. People are talking about it from a reconstructionist standpoint. That means I wanted to go back. Maybe all of us probably at some point over the last three months have said, oh, I want things to go back the way they were. But the truth is, probably all of us know it's not going to be in that same way. 
So the reconstructionist is one view, but the other view is the opportunist. And that's the exciting part. And that's where the rewiring and the looking ahead comes in. And as Pam talked about what PSS, Life University does, coming of age, what it's all about, that's the opportunist opportunistic part. So going forward, we're saying on this new era, open, be open-minded, just go forward. There's no collective thought here. The other thing that I want to say is you are going to hopefully leave with more questions than answers because our goal is to get you thinking. So if you want to walk out and have all the answers, you might as well pop off the screen right now because our goal is to kind of churn things up a little bit because that's what the times have done. So we want to do that in a, in a healthy way. So Judith, next slide, please. We said, let's be realistic. What can Judith and I really focus on? Rewiring can and will impact all the parts of our lives. But we said, okay, let's be realistic. We're gonna take a look at health, which obviously is, is very important right now. Longevity, which Pam already alluded to. Purpose. I bet there were many of you as these weeks went on. The purpose in our lives, it changed. Was the purpose, you know, making sure we got up in the morning? Was the purpose all of a sudden, as somebody said to me, to make sure that I actually, you know, put on pants that just didn't have elastic, but also a zipper to make sure you could still get in them. Purpose took on a whole other meaning. Was it all of a sudden jogging? Was it cooking? Whatever the purpose was, it was not the same purpose before basically March 16th. And the last thing was fulfillment. It is still as important today. It will be still as important going forward. And those are some of the things that we want to challenge your thinking today. So to get us started, I want to turn over to my esteemed colleague, Judith, to really have us say, how are we going to be looking at the future with a new set of eyes? Thank you, Jerry. What a great opening. Um, and I'm just going to jump right in and ask people to find the chat tool and just tell us how are you doing in this crazy time? Just type in a word or two that tells us what's going on with you. What are you feeling? Do you see where the chat tool is? It's probably at the bottom of your screen. We're gonna use this throughout a little bit. So we've got somebody hanging in there. We've got somebody adapting, up and down, doing great, fatigued and excited, pivoting connected, virtually frustrated. Well, yeah, as I expected, it's all over the place. And part of that is because uncertainty wreaks havoc with our brains and actually creates stress hormones. And as most of you know, we are wired to fight or run and we can't do either one. So it is a very challenging time to be consistent and we're not, and that's okay. But it's also, as Jerry said, it's a time to begin to reflect on who we are, where we are, and where we wanna go. And that's probably why a lot of you are here today. So I'm gonna ask you one more question in chat, but first I'd like to just give you a couple of housekeeping details. So speaking of chat, since we are gonna be using this a fair amount during the, the program, and there are a lot of you, if you put a question in, we're probably gonna lose it. So please save your questions till the end. We will ask for them and there will be an opportunity to put them in chat, but don't do it until the end because this is gonna keep running and we will possibly lose you. The second piece is some of you, many of you I hope, received a little handout by email if you registered a couple of days before the session. If you have that handout, please keep it near you. We're going to be referring to it a little bit later. And if you didn't get it, no worries, because we're going to give you a chance to catch up. But you will need a piece of paper and a pen or pencil, and that's all. So if you don't have that nearby, jump up and grab it. It won't be so terrible if you miss the next question. And I'm just going to keep going and say to folks, type yes if you're feeling guilty about not being as productive as you think you should be.
and I am not surprised to be seeing a lot of yeses. Oh, I love A lot of yeses. Well, here's what I'm going to say to that. Feeling guilty is not helpful. It doesn't move you forward. In fact, it can hold you back. So I am going to suggest that we create a safe zone right now and ask you to shelve the shoulds and just give yourself permission to be, okay? So please put the guilt aside. So we're gonna talk about what do you see for yourself when you look ahead? And I'd like you to just take a minute and think about what images come to your mind and just hold them with you a little bit so you have a sense of what they are. Here's the big question. Did you know that how you answer actually affects your health? And there's some fascinating research. We're gonna look at that right now. And the first is about optimism. So optimism, as you may imagine, is the expectation that good things are gonna happen in the future or that you will have some control over key outcomes so you can have a favorable future. And there have been studies in the past that show that optimistic individuals actually were less likely to contract chronic disease or die prematurely. But last year, there was a, a new study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which is a very prestigious organization, that showed that people who are optimistic about the future can actually have as much as an 11 to 15% longer lifespan. It's quite amazing. And that optimism is also associated with greater odds of living past 85. And by the way, this was all independent of socioeconomic status, independent of um, behavior like diet or drinking alcohol, and independent of um, any health conditions people had. So it, it's a pretty dramatic finding. Here's another one. Uh, the impact of, for example, genetics versus lifestyle. So how many of you think genetics has the largest influence on how long you live. Just type in G for genes. If you think genetics have a major impact on lifestyle. We're getting a number of Gs here. How many of you think it's lifestyle that has a major impact? Type in L. We're getting a lot of L's. Some, somebody says both. Yeah, okay, so here's what most researchers thought. They thought that the genes had about a 20 to 30% impact on lifespan. And then Ancestry.com showed up. And that meant that researchers had access to 54 million family trees. Well, guess what they found? Genes have only a 7% influence on lifespan, which means that your choices in how you live could influence up to 93%. Ready for another zinger? This one is about dementia, not something most of us like to think about, but it's a really big concern. And the Yale School of Public Health did a study of people who have a very strong risk factor for dementia. It's actually a variant of a certain gene. And in that group, those who had a more positive view of aging actually had 50% less likelihood of contracting dementia. Then the people, again, in the same high-risk group who had a more negative view of aging. So it does seem like it might be worthwhile to try to cultivate some of these positive optimistic attitudes. And how do we do that? Well, 
some of you may have heard the term well-being. That actually was a term that has become, in a way, an area of research in psychology. It was essentially launched about 20 years ago, um, and it was really a, a psychologist named Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania, who was a very well-known researcher on mental illness and particularly depression. And Seligman got elected to the presidency of the American Psychological Association. And at that time, in his inaugural speech, he called for a new focus. And basically what he said is, here we've spent all our energy and time and money investigating what makes people sick, but we haven't really looked at what makes people well, what makes them flourish. And that's when the science of positive psychology was born. And in the ensuing 20 years, 20 plus years, there has been a lot of research internationally on what enables people to do well in the world. And there are five factors that positive psychology has found are really important for well being. And I'm going to give you each of them now. The first is something you might have imagined positive emotion. So, what does that mean? It means warmth, pleasure, comfort, that kind of emotion that just really fills you up inside. The next one. Is, is engagement. And sometimes that's called flow. That sense of getting lost in what you're doing. It can happen if you're coloring. It can happen if you're reading a great story. It can happen if you happen to play a musical instrument. That just sense of you're not being there. You're just, things are flowing through you and you're just feeling so connected to whatever it is. The third area is relationships. And I'm sure we've all experienced this, that, that connecting with people is the best antidote to life's ups and downs. And there are always life's ups and downs. So having those positive relationships are really critical to our well-being. The next one is accomplishment. And that is what you know Jerry was talking about, is having a purpose and having a sense of achieving something. That is very important as we keep going in life, no matter what we do, working, not working, purpose is a much bigger area and you'll be seeing more about that from Jerry shortly. And the last one is meaning. And meaning really belie means belonging, a sense of belonging, a sense of connection to something bigger. For many people, it may be a religious or a spiritual experience, but it can also be a sense of connection to a larger group of people, a community, any kind of larger relationship. And with that context, I'm gonna turn it back to my colleague and friend who wrote the book on rewiring. Okay. Thanks, Judith. So when we talk about what you see ahead of you, I wanna go back to just taking a look at the time frame on this. So when you think about it, notice how covers have changed. Notice how the, what our images to the outside world has changed. But the interesting thing here is this book is all about self-awareness. And that's what I was saying, that probably we learned a lot about ourselves. And when I watched to, on the chat to see the different emotions you were having, and I love it when some people really, I'm doing well, I'm paralyzed. I was doing really well, now I'm going through. It's just what Judith said, really, the up and, and down. But the truth is, it's about our self-awareness, it's about our self-knowledge. And this is going to be important to us as we go forward. I don't want this just to tie in with retirement though. Judith, next slide, please. When I would travel the country, we would take a look. Whoops, next slide. Whoops, sorry. Hey. Hey. <laughs> All right, wait a second, we'll get there. Well, I can, I can continue on this, but yeah. so 
doing you know so much work and obviously in the retirement space but i know that many of you on this call today are probably at all different points on the spectrum all different aspects of transition some of you probably working at home some of you you know wanting to go back to other work other gigs but what i always love to do is hone in on this concept of retirement and i know we went one more slide perfect okay this slide used to say retirement is morphing, but I took out the word retirement because I think we'll all agree it's just the future. It's how we want to do it. How do we see it as we go forward? So the funny thing is I used to always quiz people and the gentleman on the left over here, I will have to tell you because I can't ask you, who knows, but it is Otto von Bismarck. And he was the creator in the late 1880s in Germany of the idea of retirement. The goal was to get the older worker, male, out of the workplace to the younger come in. So this sounds a little bit familiar, probably. And so all of a sudden, what happened? This came into place, but you should know at the time that the average age of the German male worker on this was about 49 years old. But it was honing in on the worker of the age of 65. That was the key but they were only living up until 49 at that point. So all of a sudden you can see that this was rather flawed from the beginning. FDR in 1933, he was one that put in social security as the social net and he also took the age of 65. I'm gonna hone in on this age of 65 for just a minute too because many of us boomers were feeling really good about ourselves, about life, what we're doing, where we're going. But in a way, COVID and the virus coming in, all of a sudden you heard this age, 65, 65. Yes, from the scientific, it is there. But what I wanna say, and Pam alluded to this earlier, it's only a number. And whether you're younger, terrific. If you're at 65 or older, I think we just have to say, hey, just because somebody else at 65 has a health implication, I don't want us to, have it preclude us from going forward or taking on new opportunities. To show you how things are changing too, I have to laugh because golf is what really became known as the icon in a way for retirement. Everybody was gonna play golf. Well, we all know not only that's not gonna keep our brains and ourselves going, but did you notice how golf took on a different meaning during this time period as we were reopening up states people would say, have the golf courses open. And some of this also refers back to what Judith was saying, senses of belonging. There's a community. These are my buddies, my women friends. I'm engaged with what's going on. It's all of a sudden, golf, yes, was what was used, but there was something bigger that was going on and is going on on that golf course. But when we talk about the future morphing, this was the model of the work, retire. If I went now and updated the slide for a fourth edition, that character, all of us would have so many different choices because that's what we have, that's what we have now. That we can discover even during these few months, like somebody wrote on the chat, I've learned more about me. I needed this time to reflect. I needed a pause. I needed a break, but we would never wittingly pull ourselves off any kind of track or slow down because most of us suffer from FOMO, fear of missing out. So in a way, this tragedy, this situation has forced us to reflect more. Next slide. I wanted to post up here and you could take a screenshot of this, but these are some of the questions if I was with you and we could do this live these are some of the observations that I have been seeing since the early work and I've kept it up during this time people lack self-awareness and self-knowledge so I'm going to challenge you just to be thinking as you're sitting there am I really aware of what turns me on what gives me my buzz makes me tick people underestimate the emotional impact associated with change. It wasn't now you maybe, if you were working, were now working at home, couldn't go to the workplace, but I heard from people say, I can't do my volunteer work. 
it's not as much fun to play bridge or, or mahjong online. I can't meet anymore with my choir. So there was an emotional impact that until this time, we might not even have realized just how important those things are in our lives. People also were always confusing what they do with who they are because we focus on our identity. But now we have pretty much of a equal playing field. So where does identity? identity fit in with your life? Where do you want to take it? And in the past, I think that when people thought about their plans, they had to have one master plan. Like the future was one big block of time. I want you to think about how this has been totally changed because we are now living in a time of phase one, two, three, and four. And at each of these phases, new things occur. Is that a new way to think about our lives? Next slide, Judith. Whoops, one going for it, yeah. The, the rest of it, or the next part that I've observed, and we have alluded to it. When, when the gentleman said to me, I'm flunking isolation, and we got into a bit of a discussion, this is exactly where he was coming from. He said, I don't have enough friends, I don't have enough interests, and what is my community? And you know, many people will say, I'm, I'm going to get into this one day. I'm really going to look at new activities. I want to get involved. This is the time to at least start thinking about it. But if you said, wow, my friends really came through. Might have been on Zoom, but the relationships were closer. If it's your interest that those were the fabulous lectures or concerts or that you were going to, then you say, wow, this was great. So. If you came up short, that becomes your planning. But if you all of a sudden said, I feel really good, those are the things that you want to make sure continue. And if you found out that there are some things I want to undertake that I really like to pursue, you've got to admit, I'm a beginner. I'm going to be vulnerable. There, it's not humanly possible on any sport activity to go from zero to 360. So maybe during this stage you say, yeah, somebody said to me, I want to learn tarot cards. And I told her, well, there are classes online and this is a way to learn something new and maybe you can not be so vulnerable, but think about what you can do. And then it comes into, and this is a lot of what also goes back to Martin Silverman's work. Do you have curiosity and imagination? Do you want to know what's around the corner? Or, or are you just pretty much happy? There's no right or wrong answer. It's whatever turns you on. And of course, a big question that we're all asking is, do we enjoy our own company? A lot of people said to me, I never imagined that I could enjoy being alone and rediscovering myself. Others are like, I'm running for the hills. I wanna go back to work as soon as possible. The reality is, remember we said earlier, there's not gonna be any new template it's gonna be our template. This is our new thinking. It's what do we want? This has been a phase, this has been a pause that it is up to us to use if we choose to. But as Judith said, there are no shoulds. You have to really, you're in the driver's seat. So all of a sudden you have to say, what would I or do I really want to do next? Next slide. I've alluded to rewiring, and yes, I, since 2002, I've been traveling the world saying it is the new way to do the future. And it is a process laid out in the book, but it really sparks you intellectually. It is about your attitude, and to me, the beginning step is you're on the call. It affects you physically because it is about movement. It is about maybe taking on, undertaking new activities, pursuing different ones. It is socially, we're social creatures, but we're also discovering that as much as we used to say, I need to see you. I mean, personally right now, I'm, I'm dying to see all of you because this is foreign for me. I love to be with the audience. I, I love to work the room. I love to go up to all of you and I can't. So the last part of the rewiring is it affects us emotionally. 
but it really is about taking that energy through our veins and putting it into new activities. Because even though we were forced to come into our homes, the energy still going through our veins when we were doing our volunteer work, going to work, hopping on the plane, consulting is still there. Where did you make it go? Because the Vitruvian man, the example I use here really is about balance. And that to me still comes back to, are we in balance? That is part of our well-being, as Judith was talking about. So next slide. So what Rick and I did is my husband, co-author, business partner, when we started developing the concept of Don't Retire, Rewire back in, in 2001, we did a major piece of research and we went around the country and we asked people in research and surveys and focus groups, one-on-ones, why do you or did you work beyond the money? Because our goal was to talk to both pre and post retirees. This is taking you back a little bit, but this was coming off the dot com era. When you think so many people were like, you know, I've hit my number financial, I'm out of here. But being a student of human nature, human behavior, I started to take a look and hearing about this longevity, what were people going to do at that time? Where were they going to get fulfillment? And were they aware of the role that work played in their life? So when we went out to ask this question, we got back unsolicited 85 reasons that we call drivers. I've listed just a few of them here to have accomplishments. Well, if you notice, Judith already alluded to it. People want a sense of some kind of completion to belong. But as we go through this, there are different interpretations because to belong, many people say, I like to belong to this, this corporate environment. Other people will say, I like to belong to like-minded people associated with an interest. Other people say, I like to be a leader. Does that have to be in the business world? Can it be not for profit? Then some people honestly started to say, why do I work? I like the recognition. Others said, it's my, it's my forum. I like to be creative. I wanna make a difference. The challenge here is to have you think about and be aware of what are your drivers? Yes, they're listed in the book and I can tell you right now, you can go to our website, www.don'tretirerewire.com where we have the top 30 drivers there. But to me, that is one of the most critical, one of the most important and truly one of the most exciting things that you could learn as we face this new era. Because if I had to think of a term, it's our personal DNA. Nobody else has what we have. You may have the same driver, but you know what? You may want to execute it in a totally different way. But you have to know what it is first. Because those drivers then can be used and should be used when you think about, well, what other activities do I want to pursue? Judith? To give you a visual... And think about when we talk about, I'm using the financial model. So when you see this you know, portfolio over here of the pie, you know that you would not have put all your money in just one instrument. Let's hope you don't in just one instrument, but rather you have a diversified portfolio so that the end of each quarter or whenever you choose, you can take a look at everything and we talk about what's your return on investment. Did it perform for you? Well, all of a sudden, the more we started thinking about our drivers and think of some of what you have in a financial, how risk oriented are you? What do you want to get out of it? Our belief was, can we take some of those same ideas and then apply them to our lives? Next slide, Judith. So what we did is to come up with the idea that I want to share is as you think about this new new things you might or not might want to do, how can you come up with creating a rewired life portfolio? But to have this be successful, it's using your drivers to think of what you want. 
So you can say right now, I think my life is looking pretty good. Then I challenge you after this and stay, take a shot of this. Where does work, play, attention for yourself, and community come into this? Because if you have a well-rounded life portfolio, when you go through the challenging times that we have and we still are, you're not just dependent on one sole activity to give you that purpose, to give you the fulfillment. So again, this is where the return on investment comes. But I've also created something in the new book. We've come up with another hook that's called ROPI, R-O-P-I, Return on Personal Investment. And that personal investment is of your time, effort, energy, and money. So hopefully some of you, most of you maybe really can sit down and say, what's been working for me? Because when I took a look at where many of you are, say feeling good, it's working, that's what I want. I want you to feel good, but take a look and then decide what do I want more of? What do I want less of? Even when Judith said about relationships, how does that fit in? Do I want more? Or the truth is, do I want less? So to get you going, one of the things that we were thinking of for this next part is we want to give you a tool or two. So going to the next page, Judith, is that it's about action. The biggest action step that you took was signing up today to be on the webinar. But using this time also to say, okay, how do I know if I do want to add some things in my life? This is a lot to take in, you know, on a, on a Tuesday afternoon. So I want to offer up the accomplishments exercise. It's in the book, but I wanted to share with you the best way to think of it. Because in working with people, sometimes it is, it is hard to jumpstart our thinking. And when you know your accomplishments, it gives you a sense of pride. You say, God, I feel pretty good. But I want you to begin to think of those accomplishments in five-year increments, starting now and going backward. Because so often in life, we're talking, well, what do you want to do? What do you want to do going forward? I believe in some of the Eastern model that you have to be. And in this instance, you have to be reflective. You have to take a look at some of those accomplishments. And I want you all to put anything and everything on there that you might say, I'm really proud of this. I'm going to use a personal comment myself when I did this exercise years ago, when I was thinking about changing a career, when I went all the way back, I remembered that I'm originally from Michigan and that one cookie season, I sold the most cookies in my group. So the Girl Scouts had an impact on me, but it made me realize that I do love sales. I do love that. And that was actually what led me many years ago to go to Working Woman Magazine originally in sales. So that's why I say to you, there are things in our lives that we've done that we can say, I want more of that. But we do need to use our time and to maybe pause. And as Judith said, hopefully you have a notebook there. You're recording things. But think about your accomplishments. And even though a lot of you said, I feel I should be doing more, well, think about what you have done during this time. It's probably more than you give yourself credit for. Even the depth of your friendships probably have blossomed in a different way. So begin to think about that. And the second one was I was able to work with Governor Ann Richards. And Ann said that this was a, uh, an exercise that she did. And this was definitely in the first book. So it's going back to 2002 and long before she knew she was ill. But she gave me this test and she said, please use it. And we do and give her credit in the book. But it's a test to say, if I only had five years and you write it down, this is what I would want to do. 
Then you go down to a year. And this is what I would want to do. And then you take it shorter, whether it's six months, whether it's three months. And it's interesting to see where the comparison's on and what from that five year has made it all the way down to the three months. Because that to me is the beginning of how you begin to think and look forward to the future. Um, when we can go out to dinner, when we can do things that have the normalcy. We don't know when, but let me tell you, you can have so much fun discovering more about yourself during this time and come out with a process that can make you feel like, you know, I am ready to rewire a few things. It's not everything. We probably have really a lot we love in our lives. But maybe a tweaking, a slight changing, things you want to do differently, things you want to do better. And don't be scared if there are some things or people that you might want to say, geez, maybe they don't fit in as much anymore. This is your time, so use it well. Back to you, Judith. Well, obviously, uh, nobody can beat Jerry with great <laughs> starting points for rewiring. And um, I just think that it's fascinating. Uh, certainly when I work with my clients, most of them are looking for exactly what Gary mentioned, which is, you know, a diversified portfolio, a, a mix of things. And so, you know, some people are looking for paid work, um, a part-time revenue stream, or even full-time something different. Others are looking for, you know, meaningful volunteer work. And those drivers, uh, which I use all the time, I use Jerry's book in my work, um, they make such a difference because, for example, I'll get somebody who's been a, you know, a senior leader and the first thing when they start to think about their next chapter is they're told, oh, go join a board. But if they get their pleasure and their, and their what Jerry likes to call psychic payoffs from working one-on-one -on -one with somebody, whether it's a younger colleague or a person who needs help, then being on a board is not going to float their boat. So you need to know yourself. And that is probably the biggest message we could give you today um, is what it is that makes you you is going to make the biggest difference going forward. But there's one more piece that needs to be in place in order for you to successfully rewire at any significant level. And that is you need to be really ready for change. Now, we all react to change differently. And of course, it's, it's uncomfortable to go from what we know to the unknown, even if it's a good change, it's unsettling. And when it's the way it's been <laughs> these last few months, who knows, you know, and there's that old saying, the enemy we know is better than the one we don't. And yet, that isn't always the most productive way to work. And so I, I want to show you three different ways of coping with change that people often fall into. So the first, I like to call powerless and paralyzed. And those are the group of us who are really, really prone to fear. And it stops us in our tracks. We can't think and we can't move. The second group, the wait and waivers. One day they're ready to do X and the next day they're, well, I don't know. I don't have enough information. I'm not sure. Maybe I'll just hold off. And the next day they're back and the next day they're, they hold off. And the third are the folks that take it in. They stop, they pause, and then they choose to do something. And it might not work, but that's okay. They're just gonna take a step. There's not one right way here, but the key is to understand that whichever way it is, that's a story that we're telling ourselves. The change itself is, is out there. 
And each of these ways of responding is our choice of how we believe we need to act. So we do have some control, we just don't realize it. And there's another way to look at this, which is the idea of mindset. So there's the fixed mindset, and that's the one that says, in our heads, I can't, I can't make this move, I can't take this leap, I don't have enough information, I'm not ready, I just can't. And it feels like a, a dead end. And then there is what you can call the growth mindset, which is more of, okay, I, I don't have all the answers, but I can do it. You know, I, I have a, a client who I like to say is 79 years young. I'll call him Lou. And he is actually rewiring at full speed. And what he likes to say is there's only two things I can control, my mindset and my output. But the mindset determines the output. So we sit, we work on his goals, we figure out where, you know, what he wants, and then he focuses on getting what he calls in the zone. And it's literally working on his mindset. So part of what you need is that feeling of vision of where you want to be, and then that willingness to take the next step. And we're going to get started now on getting you into that mindset and actually starting a little rewiring. So this is the moment to go find the handout that you had or grab a piece of paper and a pen or a pencil and just make 10 columns, 10 vertical columns like you see on the screen. And you're gonna put headings in each column and I'll just read them out and you can keep filling them in as we talk. There's career, there's financial. And by the way, this is just for you. It's not being graded. It's not gonna be collected. So don't worry about being perfect. Just do it so you can read it. So I said career, financial, physical, spiritual, social support, emotional intimacy, family, learning and growing, home and work environment, and play slash fun. So those are the 10 categories we're, we're talking about. These are the pieces of your life. They're the pillars of a balanced life. These are all the pieces that go into who we are and the way we live. Now, Think about how satisfied you are in each of these areas. And what you're going to do is you're going to actually rank that level of satisfaction. So if you think about the bottom as a one being the least satisfied and the top as a 10 being the most satisfied, just draw a horizontal line at the point of satisfaction that you feel in each category. So if you, thought that you are about 50% comfortable with where your physical life is physically. And, and it's, it's all about how you define it. So physical could be um, how you feel. It could be how you, how much uh, fitness you have. It could be nutrition. It could be any area of your physical being. If you feel 50% satisfied, you would draw a line halfway across. So do this with each category. Okay, I'm going to let the, those of you that are still doing it continue. For everyone who did this, I want you to look at your responses now and pick one category that you'd like to improve just a little bit, just a tiny bit, like one degree. And it doesn't have to be the one that is the lowest satisfaction. It can just be whichever one pops into your mind that you'd like to be a little more satisfied in right now. Okay, so think about what is one thing you would like to do to create that greater satisfaction. 
And now what I'm going to do is ask for a couple of brave volunteers who would like a little coaching to type in the chat what your category was and what your one thing is. There's no pressure here. If you don't feel you want to do it, don't worry about it. But it helps others to see some people's ideas because I'm going to work with it a little bit. So um, anyone who feels like they'd like to share it, please do. Um, I'll give you a little longer. And if you don't, that's fine. I've got some examples from other groups, so we can do that. But if you feel like you want to type it in, I'll give you a little more time. So think about one category you'd like to improve and what's the one thing you thought you would do to improve it. So I have one response, but not the thing they'd like to do. I just have the category. So try to add what it is you think you might do to increase, to increase your satisfaction. Okay, here we go. Getting a couple of good examples. I'm gonna start with um, one that so many people want to improve, which is play and fun. And this person says, all I've been doing or had been doing is not accessible. I haven't found substitutes. And somebody else put, put, they want to do enjoyable activities with other people. So the thing that both of them have in common is that they are kind of broad and not very specific. So I'm going to suggest that we try to drill down to one specific thing you could do between today and tomorrow that would improve that area. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Download a joke app. Make a list of TV shows that make you laugh. And watch one. Think about what gives you pleasure. What are the fun things that you enjoy doing? But think about just finding one. Somebody suggested make phone calls to create enjoyable activities with others. That's a great way to, but I would say make one phone call to one person that you know would make you feel more connected and having more fun. Somebody else, a couple of people talked about emotional intimacy. And they talked about wanting to improve communication with family and friends. And somebody said, increase the intimacy by talking about what I need and what I'm missing. So I'm going to suggest pick one person that you're going to call and think about one thing you're going to say to them that might be a little bit of a stretch, that might be a little hard but will make you feel more connected to that person. So do you see how we're talking about really tiny steps? Somebody mentioned learning and growing and they said projects. Okay, what's one project? And if you think about the project, what's the first thing you could do to get started on that project? Maybe it's making a list of what would it be entailed. That's all you're going to do for today is make that list. And then tomorrow you can think of one more thing. So there's a saying this is all about, which is by the inch, it's a cinch. By the yard, it's hard. And if you think about making tiny steps, but very specific commitments, change is easier. So again, if you have questions, save them till the end. I'm going to move on. I'm going to talk about how setting goals is so important. And we've talked about breaking them into small steps, but having goals to start with is not only important 
in work, which is where we often have them. But as you can see from, he, from this um, study in the clinical gerontologist publication, it, having goals as you age also helps you age more successfully. So this is pretty much getting to the end. We've talked about how rewiring uh, is really about belief in possibilities and that it can impact your health and your well-being and even your lifespan. And we're going to now see a couple of ways that some smart people have put this. And the first one is our old friend Mark Twain, who says, 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the ones you did. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, and explore. There's another one from Emerson, the great writer. He who is not every day conquering some fear has not learned the secret of life. Some of you may recognize this lady who said, some guy said to me, don't you think you're too old to sing rock and roll? And I said, you better check with Mick Jagger. So I'm just gonna close by saying the rewiring process that Jerry has shared is pretty straightforward, but it can be challenging to do it on your own because you're stretching beyond your comfort zone. And sometimes that's harder than it seems. And I, having done it myself, uh, you know, I, as a work-life strategy coach, I'm passionate about helping people really see how to do that and holding their hands or kicking their butts to help them do it. So I'm going to invite you to think about whether you could use some help. And um, with my individual clients, um, I work very hands-on and I use Jerry's book. Um, the drivers are a very big piece of what we do. And in fact, we create an entire inventory of all the aspects of your life. I also use other tools and of course, all the skills of coaching uh, to get your mind and your mindset moving. Um, and I also, by the way, do customized resources for people's needs. So depending on what you wanna do next, uh, I have a client who wants to be a novelist and I connected her with a published writer who happens to be in my network and she's been getting some great guidance. Um, so I am going to suggest that if you are interested in a 30 minute conversation about that possibility, and it's, conf it's confidential, it's complimentary, type, your, type a C now for conversation in the chat, and um, I will email you. There's also something I've just created for this purpose, and because of this webinar, which is small group coaching. And I'm creating two Zoom options, one, uh, they're, they're both basically with to go through the book and to give you the energy and the support of other committed rewirers. So if you'd like to know more about the group options, type G into the chat and I will email you the details and the dates. We're actually going to start in two weeks. And again, so C is for the conversation about individual coaching and G is for the group possibilities. Um, and now I think it's time for some questions. So I will pass it I'll stop sharing. Great. And we can just talk. So Let's see if we have any questions. You can type them into the chat now. We do have just one question in the Q&A box. Okay. And I think you just you ins inserted it. But yeah. um, if you want to go back 
can see it. Why don't you read it out? Because I'm staying uh, in the chat. Okay, so he says, do you offer any virtual group for people who wants to work more on this? Individual? Groups for people who want to more yes, work so more the, on this. So the groups are exactly for this purpose. Uh, there are four person groups and six person groups and they have different details. And I, I have a, uh, an email that I will be sending to everybody who types in G for group. It will explain all about how we're working and what it takes. And if you're interested in a possible individual work, that would be a C. Um, and so we, we will be starting in two weeks for the groups. And um, it's, it's a really exciting process because I think the book is so inspiring and um, it's great to be able to work with other people together on it, so. Okay, so um, will you be able to um, save everybody that says G? Well, this is all in the chat. So I'm assuming that you're going to be giving me the chat. Um, I don't think we can save that, but I'll yeah, try. Yeah, I actually think you can, you can record your chat. Okay, so it's been recorded. So yeah. the, whole, the whole webinar is being recorded, so we can go over it. Okay, so we'll do that. Great. So any questions that you would like to ask either Jerry or myself? Or you're letting a lot soak in. I, we I know. Too. I know. <laughs> yeah, people are thinking about, there's a lot of folks thinking about whether they want the, the group, I see. Pamela, you stay here with us. I am here. I am most impressed. I had my own thinking challenged, and I hope everyone else certainly has. Uh, what I think has been so uh, enriching about this kind of a presentation is it isn't a lot of talking at us, but it gives us some tools and some things that we can start thinking about and doing on our own. Um, I think for those who are maybe struggling with the uh, rewiring concept and, and um, in the light of, of certain circumstances, it might be a good idea to have a coaching session or pick up Jerry's book and start somewhere. Uh, it's, it's a very positive approach to everything we're going through in our life. When we do the Explore Your Future workshop, we do something similar to the pillars uh, we look at um, the pie of life and we try to determine what percentage of time are you spending in your work or your leisure or your learning or your physical development or spiritual whatever. And it, it just gives you an instant picture like the pillars do of where you need some little bit of a, a nudge, whether it comes from within, if you're strong enough, uh, or you need a little external uh, encouragement to do that. Gary, I'm, I'm going to interrupt because there is a question that I think is really useful, which is the book is when somebody just looked it up and it refers to retirement versus work uh, yeah. versus full-time work. And, and maybe you can talk about how people can use this book, even if they're not ready to retire right now, but just thinking about what is rewiring do for you even if you're still continuing to work sure. if you probably notice the the tagline is five steps to fulfilling work that fuels your passion serves your purpose fills your pocketbook so it is very much oriented to the person who wants to work one of the things we actually do because it's hard i mean as i was sitting here participating and listening for people to grasp it we actually follow four individuals through the book so that you can see how, how they discover their drivers, how they utilize their drivers to look for, you know, entrepreneurial work in corporate environments, starting their own businesses, doing, you know, a volunteer work as well. But the root of all of this, even if we're talking about the pillars, really goes back to that question about 
why do you or did you work beyond the money? Because every one of us knows that we have been in situations, work opportunities that have come forward, and they didn't always totally fulfill us. They will pay the bills, they will do it, but they didn't turn us on in the same way. So maybe you look back and you think, I didn't last in that job that long. Because maybe there weren't really things that were playing to our strengths, our skills, what motivated us. So yes, I'm going to use this example too. So, and it is for paid work, but across the board, because work is a part of our life. Now, is it always positioned in the, in the career and the work sessions at the Barnes and Nobles or online? Absolutely. But it is that piece of knowing what makes you tick. A client that I had worked with when we were developing the book at the very beginning, did research with her. And she was thinking ahead to what did she want to do when she did exit her corporation. And she had said her interest was the homeless. And she said, I really want to spend more time there. About six months after she had fully retired, and I ran into her and I said, hey, I heard you're working at the church in the soup kitchen. And I said, how's it going? And she said, I just hate it. Now, I was a bit surprised about this. And I said, no, that just doesn't make sense because she was cared so much about them. When she and I sat down and we went over her drivers, her one driver was to make a difference, which she was doing. Another driver though was recognition and leadership and problem solving. And what we realized is that she shouldn't be working in the soup kitchen. That wasn't what was sparking her she realized I want to work on the program side and then work my way up if this board is appropriate. So that's how this drivers and the book get you thinking differently. You're really like peeling back on, on the onion and there's tears along the way. Because sometimes what you think about yourself when you really get into it, it's like, wow, that, that isn't really what turns me on. In following these four people, I'm going to say you get to be a voyeur. You're an eavesdropper. And you really watch people as they go through these journeys. And sometimes you yourself will think, wow, I don't know if I would have made that decision or not. But it's a good way for all of us to learn sometimes through the works and the narrative of other people. And then we bring it back to ourselves. So, yes, but to the person who's questioning, take the time to just go on the website. It's not steeped in things, but it begins to give you a sense and also reading people's testimonials to what they, they got out of it. So the other question that I want to answer, we're getting a number of different versions of it, is really to clarify the difference between the group coaching and the individual coaching. So what I'm going to say is the group coaching is really focused on the book and the book has five steps, as Jerry said. And what we're going to do is really support each other in going through the work that each step requires us to do and hold each other accountable for doing that work. And we will be supporting each other and sharing ideas and things like that. The individual coaching goes much more deeply into, for, for example, the mindset areas, the issues about what, what's holding you back, what is getting in the way of your being able to move forward? Are there pieces in your life that really need some attention? And what kind of support do you need in order to be able to even take the steps going forward? And it's much more, quite honestly, of individual handholding and also offering opportunities. We take you, in the individual work, I actually get people to the point where they have some scenarios that they're thinking about and they may need support in carrying them out. And I work with them on um, making announcements, on exploring possibilities, as I said before, if they need to um, look into an idea. I have all sorts of resources for people to uh, get guidance, get other people's experience, get more information. Um, I used to be a journalist and I collect information, it's just, part of what drives me. So I have a lot that I share with folks and um, that is what goes with the, um, the individual coaching. And that can carry out 
uh, a little longer than this uh, group work, which is really geared to the five steps. So you'll get more details on the group. When I send the uh, email to you, it has a lot of the information. Um, so, and we also, you can always email me if you have any more questions after you receive it. That will all be on the, uh, the form. So happy to share any more information as you need it. I think it's been a wonderful presentation. Oh. I think the energy that yeah. both of you bringing and your own passion to this kind of personal growth and personal development is exactly what we need right now. We're very, very hungry for that kind of thing and the optimism and the hope and the excitement in our own interior life. Uh, I can't thank you enough. Um, I can't thank the participants enough for for taking that step and being a part of this. You've made the first big step. Way to go. And I hope that uh, you both will come back again and that we can explore this on a deeper level. Be a pleasure. That would be great. Thank you, Thank Cam. You. Thank you to everyone. Thank you.